Hi, I'm Gavin, and welcome back to The Sound Project. Today we're going to talk about the topic of frequency response. And frequency response is a metric that we look at all the time in the projects that we work on, whether it be a recording studio or a church or any sort of uh, facility where uh, we're trying to look at the sound quality inside of the space. And with the frequency response, it's a, a measure of how accurately the system produces sound uh, from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz typically is what we're looking at. And the graph here on the right side of the screen shows the frequency response of a room that does doesn't have any acoustical treatment, and there's a lot of uh, uh, issues that come with that. You have cancellation and buildup in the, the lower frequency range, you have comb filtering in the higher frequency range, and we'll talk about uh, what those mean here in just a little bit. Uh, but it shows which frequencies are amplified or reduced. Um, on this graph, you have amplitude on the y-axis, so that's decibel level and SPL level. And, uh, and then on the x-axis, you have frequency. And so this one uh, goes from uh, low frequencies up to higher frequencies on the right side of the graph. Um, a consistent frequency response is typically what we're looking at for mu musical applications. You know, a flat frequency response is a lot of times considered accurate frequency responses, uh, but peaks and dips cause coloration in what we're hearing. And that's what's typically common in, in these rooms that we're designing is that if there is no acoustical treatment, your frequency response is erratic, and then you're making decisions based on the way the room sounds and not the way the recorded material uh, presents itself. And so, you have to kind of look at what uh, is going to affect the frequency response. What's going to cause these peaks and dips and, and uh, uh, issues in that frequency response? And there's a lot of things that that uh, go into it. The room shape and the room size, uh, that really factors into things because uh, depending on your room ratios, uh, when it comes to like a studio, you're going to have uh, room modes that are going to impact the lower frequency side of things. And the shape of it is going to affect if there's any sort of focusing or, or build up of certain, certain frequencies. Uh, that's that's going to uh, play into it. Surface materials is another one. You know, if if you have an all concrete room that doesn't absorb low frequencies, it just reflects it back into the space, you're going to have more issues uh, than if you maybe had a drywall wall that can flex with that energy and, and absorb a little bit of that that low frequency energy. The speaker placement is going to be very important as well. And this is something I, I tell people all the time is I, I'd like to them to experiment with their speaker placement and their listening position placement because uh, it's going to change quite a bit actually if you move your speakers and retest or uh, whether subjectively or with an omnidirectional measurement microphone, the placement of the speakers with regards to how far away from the walls that they are, the height that they are, uh, the equilateral triangle that you're trying to create, all of that is going to impact the frequency response uh, along with the listening location like we talked about a, a lot on this channel about how the mix position uh, typically you want it to be about 38 percent of the length of the room if you have a fairly rectangular sized room and if you're more at let's say the 25 percent point you may have more peaks and dips to deal with than if you were in a better position so again experimentation is key i always tell people to uh, uh, move things around because uh, you can spend that time and and it'll really pay off to have a, a better frequency response. The, spec, the specs of the speaker are going to really impact the frequency response as well. Like some speakers don't produce down in the lower frequencies as well as others and whether or not you have a subwoofer in your system. And so what, how you're exciting the room with what frequencies is going to impact that frequency response as well. Early reflections, um, that's another thing in, in small rooms that are going to impact the frequency response, especially in that higher frequency range where you have comb filtering. And then the equipment that you're running things through, that can all color the sound as well. So a lot of different things go into the frequency response of your room. So what's an ideal frequency response? And that's that's a hard uh, question to answer because uh, there's there's a lot of different answers that you could get out there and it's, it's somewhat uh, subjective. There's not necessarily a, a by the book answer here, but for a recording studio, typically uh, plus or minus three decibels across the, the frequency spectrum is considered really great. Uh, honestly, if, if you can get it plus or minus five decibels, uh, then you're doing really good. And, and that means that from the lowest dip to the highest peak, you're at about 10 decibels of 
of difference if it's plus or minus five or six decibel difference if it's plus or minus three. And so uh, typically that's what we're shooting for in that range, that you know three to five. Um, I think that the best studio that we've done with, that we measured was around a, a dB and a half, uh, plus or minus a dB and a half. So uh, you can get there, but it all depends on uh, what kind of space that you have available to you, the design, the speakers, all these things that I just mentioned on the last slide, it all factors into that frequency response that, that you end up getting at the end of the day. Um, in home theaters, a lot of times it's nice to have a little bit of a slight bass boost. So the low frequencies are a little bit more enhanced in a home theater because it's less for critical listening and it's more for uh, you know fun and excitement of watching a, a film and there's explosions and different things like that that happen that the low frequency bass boost can, can help uh, with that. For a speech-focused room, you really uh, sometimes want to boost the 2K to 4K uh, um, kilohertz um, range because that's where our consonant frequencies are, and we need some of that energy. We want to make sure that th those rooms aren't more uh, heavily dead or dry in the higher frequencies because that's removing a lot of information that can be helpful for the listener to be able to discern from one word to the next. So room modes, uh, there's a lot of things that go into room modes, and that's something that we can cover on, on another uh, uh, podcast here. But uh, the room modes are going to impact the low frequency range. Typically, it's 300 hertz and below, uh, the range that, that is uh, highlighted on the screen here. And the a lot of things factor into how those room modes are going to impact things. The, the room size and shape, like I mentioned, uh, the ratio of the length, width, and height of the room, especially if you're in a rectangular room, um, you want to select dimensions that aren't divisible by the same number or each other, if possible. Um, but also understand that, that a lot of times we're just given the room that that, that we have available. It's a second bedroom or a third bedroom that, that you can put your gear in. Uh, a lot of times you want to just select the one with the, the best dimensions possible. So rooms that are, let's say, 10 foot by 10 foot by 8 foot, they're going to struggle more than ones that have, uh, you know, let's say a 9 foot by 11 foot by 8 foot room. Similar in size, except the one that has the dimensions that are all divisible by 2 and the length and the width are equal, then your frequency response is going to be way more erratic in a space like that. Um, so large peaks and dips, they can be minimized with proper acoustical treatment and proper placement of your gear and your listening position. And subwoofers can help a lot with canceling out some, some room mode issues as well. So you may not can think you need a subwoofer to extend that low frequency response of your speakers. You might have some nice size speakers there, but the subwoofer can be placed in ways that it can calm down some of the room modes and, and help us in that regard. So with the uh, low frequency response, the, it's the most problematic frequency range uh, it, for, for small rooms due to the fact that, that the physical wavelengths are actually longer than the room dimensions, okay? So uh, that, that is something where uh, every frequency has a wavelength and there's an equation, it's C is equal to F times lambda and C is the speed of sound, F is frequency in hertz and lambda is the wavelength in feet. So you can always figure out, depending on what frequency you're dealing with, what its physical wavelength is. But for instance, for 80 hertz, the wavelength for that is 14.125 feet. So if you're in a room that's 10 by 10 by 8, the physical dimensions of the room are actually smaller than the wavelength of 80 hertz. You go down to, to 40 hertz and it's over 28 feet long. And uh, so that's why low frequencies are such uh, uh, problematic in these small rooms because the wavelengths are physically larger than the dimensions of the room. Uh, the graph here at the top of the slide here, you've got um, uh, the green line was before acoustical treatment and the blue line was after acoustical treatment. So the difference between the green line and the blue line is, is pretty dramatic. You know, you've got uh, the, the blue line is way more consistent and smooth and is going to allow you to make better decisions as a mix engineer because there's less discrepancies between what's real and what your room is producing. Uh, the bottom graph here is the frequency response of a typical small bedroom studio uh, in the low frequency range again. And uh, notice how there's just so many peaks and dips in this space uh, and, and causes like there's some dips that are around um, you know 30 decibels below what the average is and that makes it very hard to uh, hear that sound properly and then you would overcompensate for that and so every room is going to have a different frequency response um, because of all those factors I mentioned before every single room has a different condition there then and that's why um, it's so much fun to, to take measurements in these spaces and kind of see how that room and the gear and the equipment and speaker positioning, listening position is all impacting that frequency response. 
Um, so comb filtering is the next part that we want to talk about, and that's affecting the higher frequency range. I highlighted that 1,000 hertz and up. Um, and what happens with comb filtering is it's when reflected sound arrives back at the listener slightly delayed from the direct sound. So you have two speakers in your room, the sound is hitting your ears, a direct path from the speaker to your ears, but then there's a reflected path coming off of sidewalls, the ceiling, the desk, the floor, the rear wall, all sorts of different surfaces in the room, and arriving back to your ears in short succession to the direct sound. And what that causes is a, a bit of a, a phase cancellation. So it's, it's coming back shifted in time and it can create cancellation and buildup in these higher frequencies that look like really sharp spikes. It's called comb filtering because it looks like the teeth of, of a comb. And uh, what it can do is create an unnatural and kind of hollow, almost metallic sound in the room. And it can impact the, the clarity of, of uh, um, intelligibility of speech in larger rooms. And so comb filtering can be taken care of just with proper acoustical treatment, especially just hitting first reflection points in your room. If you're able to identify first reflection points uh, in your space or it's the halfway distance between you and your speakers on the side walls, front wall, rear wall, ceiling, and hit that with acoustical treatment, a comb filtering is going to be greatly reduced uh, and you're only going to be left with reflections that come off of your desk and other things that are, are close to you. And so I highly recommend if you're starting your journey on uh, treating your room, uh, just start with some, some first reflection point treatments and, and see where that gets you and then you can move on to base trapping and, and diffusion fusion and other, other options. Um, so reducing, uh, you know, the, it, this effect of comb filtering, um, if, if we put acoustical treatment in the right spots and we position our monitors and, and everything efficiently, uh, comb filtering can be reduced and your room's going to sound a whole lot better. Um, so there's different ways you can measure the frequency response because uh, I want to give you tools to be able to to experiment and and it, what's best is that you can uh, obviously uh, experiment with subjectively listening in your space and see which things sound better but it's always nice to have a graph to look at to be able to see what frequency ranges are, are struggling and so I put up here on the screen a, a lot of different uh, software packages that you could use in order to measure the frequency response of your room um, some of them are free like the Room EQ Wizard, um, but then the other ones that uh, they do have a cost associated with them. Uh, we use a lot of these different uh, um, software packages. Uh, I'd say for small rooms we we use Fuzz Measure uh, quite often. For larger rooms we use Arda more more uh, frequently. Uh, but all of these software packages are great. Um, NTI is more of a um, a hardware piece, so it's a, a, a handheld device that you would use. But if you're looking for a software, like you can't go wrong with some of the ones on the the top line of the uh, of this uh, chart here. And so improving your frequency response, there's uh, ways that you can do that. I mean, the first thing starts with conducting frequency response tests. And every software package, is, uh, they, they do this a little bit differently. Some of them use a swept sign signal going from 20 uh, hertz to 20 kilohertz. And uh, other ones use pink noise. And so it just depends on that software package, which one you're using. But whichever one you choose, the first thing you do is conduct a frequency response test. And normally, you put that microphone exactly where your listening position is in your studio and you run the tests through the speakers and you can start to look at the results and see, you know, the great thing about doing that is that it's information. Even before you uh, solve the issue with acoustical treatment, you at least know what the issues are. And the next time you reach for that fader that to boost a certain frequency, um, you, you might not need to do that. And, and you would at least know uh, that that is a, a discrepancy and a thing in your, your studio that is a, a known uh, factor. And so you first take this frequency response test the next is determine which frequencies need to increase or decrease. So you can look and see peaks and dips in the frequency response and target in on like, why is why is this occurring? So you have to, to figure out what's causing those peaks and dips. And if it's in that lower frequency range, it's most likely driven by a room mode issue. And um, there's various room mode calculators out there where you can plug in your uh, dimensions of your room and figure out, okay, is this a axial mode or a tangential mode uh, that I'm dealing with? And then depending on what it is, that's going to determine how you uh, handle the bass trapping. And of course, like 
if you don't want to do this on your own, you can reach out to us and we can help you with that. Um, but if you're in the experimentation phase, it's nice to just kind of take a look at the frequency response, compare it to maybe a room mode uh, calculator and, and uh, see, see what kind of problems that you're having. And then the last thing is, is acoustically treat that space to, to suit your needs. Because if some of those issues are happening in the higher frequencies and you see the comb filtering that I showed you on a, a previous slide, uh, then that's where early reflection control is going to be really important. So in summary, for frequency response, uh, it affects everything that you record in here, you know, and, and that's very important to try to get it as accurate as possible, especially if you're in a recording studio and you need to make accurate decisions when you're mixing. Um, a, a flat monitor response doesn't always equal a flat room response because there's all those other factors that I mentioned that are going to impact it. And so obviously you want to get a really nice, accurate speaker system, uh, but then once that gets placed in a room, all bets are off because those speakers were typically tested in an anechoic chamber where it's suspended in the middle of a room that's uh, treated with 100% absorption everywhere. Um, and so once it's put into a room with uh, um, deficiencies when it comes to, to treatment, then it's going to impact that frequency response. Um, you want to aim for neutral uh, gear and, and treated rooms for reliable monitoring, you know, like having a clean gear that's not going to color the frequency response, but then also having good acoustical treatment in there is helpful. And uh, an accurate frequency response frequency response equals better mixes and efficiency uh, and repeatability. And, you know, we're always looking for ways to be more efficient in the studio and make sure that you're getting mixes out on time and not having to question yourself and constantly bouncing a mix, be able to go listen to it in your car uh, to be able to check it. If you can trust your room and the, the frequency response that you have, then you won't have to do those extra steps and it will speed up your process. And uh, yeah, I recommend to measure the frequency response of your room, make adjustments and learn. You know, it's, it's always nice to experiment and, uh, and, and be able to make adjustments and see how it's improving your setup. So that's been another episode of The Sound Project. Thanks for being a part of it. If you have any questions about the frequency response in your room, feel free to comment that below and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.